Hi everyone, my name is Sumin, and welcome to our STEAM Odyssey exhibition opening event. And today, over the course of around one hour, we would like to introduce our exhibition, the thoughts and research behind the project and its making process, and how you can experience the exhibition followed by a short conversation by our directors and guests. The 2021 a STEAM Odyssey exhibition presents an ongoing research into application of augmented reality technologies and their impact on architectural design and construction. The centerpiece of the exhibition, designed in collaboration with Eagle Pantage, is a structure built out of steam bent hardwood using primitive hand tools augmented with the precise uh, precision of um, augmented with the precision of intelligent holographic guides. It represents a full-scale section of a fully functional, inhabitable space, further, ex uh, further evolving the methodology developed for the 2019 Tallinn Biennale uh, Steampunk Pavilion designed by myself, Igor Pantic, Guilin Jian, and Cameron Newham. Uh, this exhibition is open until 29th of August, and if you are in LA, I hope you can get a chance to visit our gallery and ex experience the installation physically. And now I would like to invite David Kim and Shun Sasaki to talk about their experience. David and Shun are current SciArc students who worked on this project um, as core member uh, over the last three months. And they have been the augmented heroes who actually built the installation piece. And welcome, David and Shun. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah. And David and Shun, today I'm going to uh, maybe, uh, I want to hear your thoughts uh, about your experience and uh, the project itself and your impression. Um, but maybe before anything, I would like you to introduce yourself first. Yeah, maybe starting from David. Hello, my name is David Zeng Kim. Um, uh, I will be third year undergrad this upcoming uh, fall semester. Uh, thank you so much for having me today, and um, I hope you all have a wonderful time. <laughs> yeah. And Shun? Uh, nice to meet you all. Uh, I'm Shun Sasaki, uh, also becoming a th third year from coming semester. And uh, uh, thank you for inviting me here, and I'm uh, very happy to be here. Um, hope all of you have a good, great time with us. Yeah, thank you very much. David and Shun and myself also, uh, we have been working in the SIAC parking lot, really building this thing for over the three months uh, time. And you have done a tremendous work, and I really appreciate your hard work and dedication. Um, and maybe I want to uh, first thing, uh, ask your impression about the exhibition piece itself and maybe the um, internship experience. Yeah, maybe starting from David. Yes, um, this was my first internship and also first um, digital fabrication work that I ever done. Uh, it was such a great opportunity and um, it was such a severe experience that I had. So it was a wonderful, uh, wonderful th uh, three months of time and I really enjoyed it. Maybe that's working. Uh, uh, so uh, same as David, uh, I'm really glad like uh, to join this internship. Um, this is also my first time to join. It's such a great opportunity, and uh, I really enjoyed it and learned a lot. Thank you. Yeah, and we, um, yeah, it was a really kind of unique experience, I would say, yeah. And maybe can you talk about a little bit about the whole experience of fabricating outside, yeah. Um, yes, um, this project uh, reminded me of a DIY in a large scale, which um, professional um, contractors like us could still build this amazing like piece, uh, which was very um, interesting. And also, uh, the hologram, uh, Hololens, were giving an, all, all the instructions like how we should follow. So it wasn't that difficult to yeah, keep processing. Um, the project, yeah, it was really nice experience. Yeah, yeah oh, for sure, I agree. Like it was tremendous uh, achievement. Uh, unprofessional people like us uh, achieved like this magnificent scale building. And uh, also for me, um, you know, as a student, it's less kind of opportunity to expose ourselves into construction world. 
And uh, with this kind of new technology, um, it was awesome. That's a truly amazing uh, experience. Great. I also really enjoyed working with you guys. Yeah. And um, yeah, there, uh, there has been also a lot of uh, maybe thoughts or stereotypes about computational design um, is mostly in front of uh, computer screens, yeah? But I think uh, what we did was really uh, concentrating on also executing the digitally designed uh, geometries into uh, a physical reality, right? So what do you think about this uh, kind of combination between uh, computational design and fabrication and uh, the, the focus on the construction and building experience? Yes, um, I had a, like yeah for sure I had a stereotype about um, digital um, computational design, which I thought is mainly in a digital world. However, uh, after starting this work um, by using AR technology into real physical um, like construction was such yeah. a unique experience, surreal experience that I ever ha ever had, and I saw a, like a new potentials also by using these technologies. Um, yeah, I got a sense that um, I might use this kind of technology uh, for my future um, career or development also. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, for sure, like, uh, this was a pretty um, amazing opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, especially like, as a SciArc student, like, uh, what, we do is, uh, what we do is like, a pretty uh, tech-driven and the more computational side of design. But um, with this fabrication skill, like, we can kind of prove what we can do also by using computational design as well. So um, making this physical model um, means a lot to us. Yeah, that's an awesome answer, yeah. Um, yeah, and let's just talk about some uh, difficulties that we encountered or uh, something interesting, yeah. But maybe we can uh, first talk about the unique experience using the AR device, yeah. So we were using Microsoft HoloLens, right, in the um, yeah, during the uh, over the course of the making uh, of this piece, yeah, and maybe maybe just uh, for our audiences, maybe share your experience a little bit. Um, yes, uh, using Hololens, uh, I mean we we were mainly working outside, outdoor uh, tent, and um, I believe Hololens had a like such a great kind of um, technology which we could. Um, use it in outside world. Or... And we couldn't build this without it, Yeah, right? of course, yeah. Uh, it was, uh, we definitely couldn't build because the instruction was all fully in uh, mm -hmm. hologram, and as a three-dimensional yeah. like, hologram. So um, yeah, that was such a yeah, great kind of experience using um, like HoloLens while mm -hmm. working on this. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I would say like, uh, uh, Every single step we use like a hollow lens and they check like if it's precise or not and uh, if it seems okay, okay, we can move on. If it's not, like we can fix some issue, tiny issue. And also um, to construct like uh, this magnificent building, we you, you, like bend more than 100 brackets and uh, without having hollow lens, it cannot be you know, accomplished. So yeah. it was a great opportunity. And, uh, but there's also a lot of difficulties. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Uh, we were having some um, difficulties, which uh, we had hard time like seeing the 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 holo hologram. Yeah, 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 it didn't like show it that well, yeah. and also because the weather, yeah, weather was too hot. Yeah. And uh, so, like, yeah, the battery life issue. Yeah, the, the device, for sure. It gives the you heavy headache. device. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You did a great job. Yeah, yeah. wearing the yeah. heavy device oh, for yeah. such a long time. Yeah, yeah. that was great. <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, there's. Pros and cons, yeah. But I'm sure the technology will uh, evolve, yeah. And it's it's not as easy as it seems, yeah. <laughs> uh, definitely, yeah. But maybe uh, to maybe move on to the to the topic about the the wood itself. Like we used, we uh, we chose to use steam bending process, which is a very traditional uh, process. But uh, because of the AR, we could have. Uh, made the steam bending process into uh, to create a lot of multiple different curvature right um, and although this uh, has been a, a proven process but we failed also a lot right 
So we also kind of broke many timber pieces, yeah. And do you maybe, can you talk about a bit how, um, what kind of difficulties we encountered during, about the material itself and how, how we um, go about some problems and improve our process? Uh, yes. Uh... I think first we did lots of material studies like using different thickness of wood, also different um, material, uh, different like, kind of wood. And um, uh, we eventually decided to use the red oak wood, which was um, quite uh, good on holding those kind of uh, complicated curvature. Uh, but still there were um, some difficulties, like we couldn't figure it out like, so, uh, sometimes why it breaks. Like, because um, all the woods has different conditions. So um, that was the most difficulties that we had. But we also had like the way how to solve, which maybe you can explain it, Shin. Yeah, for sure. Like every single time we observe what was the reason to fail and like what was the reason to succeed and uh, um, kind of affect those kind of reflection onto the next step. So it was great steps for us. Yeah. So initially we broke quite many pieces and whenever it broke we kind of uh, throw it away but after some time we learned how to fix it yeah and even they slightly break we did decided how to we learned how to save the the break yeah and yeah it was a really interesting journey and I think this is kind of really important that we uh, trial and error that we experience it and then uh, learn how to problem solve, yeah, so we can, even if we have more complex tasks in the future, we can actually solve it. So I, I kind of really enjoy this process, and I don't know what is your thought about this learning process, yeah, trial and error, yeah. Yeah, for sure, I agree, like, uh, we learned a lot, and every single time, like, we have to, th we had to think about what was the reason, and uh, mm. try to stay log logical, and uh, try to fix every single time, like, uh, that was really fun and also a great opportunity as a student, yeah. And one thing I believe, uh, we didn't have that much difficulties like working on this project, I believe. The only um, difficulty was my personal um, problem, which I didn't like, I didn't enjoy using HoloLens because <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want it to, um, yeah, Your like hair, break my hairstyle, hairstyle yeah. <laughs> it should be perfect every time, so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was that the was only issue that uh, I had, yeah. but uh, otherwise I think I really enjoyed this project, it was very yeah. unique and I, I really loved it. Yeah. yeah, you did a fantastic job, I really thank you, so thank you, for, <laughs> thank yeah, you. for this uh, experience and like, working with us, yeah. Uh, it's really fantastic and we are really proud to um, uh, show and introduce this piece to the world and hope uh, our audiences and friends uh, do not miss the chance to see the piece in real life. Um, and coming to the next, I'm going to pass the mic to my colleague, uh, the co-designer of this project, Igor Pantic. Igor is a lecturer at the Bartlett Pro UCL, who have been researching on computational design and augmented fabrication for a number of years and running an exp experimental design unit under the same agenda. Igor will give us a talk over Zoom, connected from London, and will be giving us an overview of the thoughts and research behind this project. And let's welcome Igor. Welcome. welcome Igor. <laughs> Hello. I hope everyone can see my screen. <clears throat> All right, so good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Igor Pantic, and uh, in this short presentation, I will try to explain the background behind Sumins and my research into augmented reality assisted design and fabrication, and how it led to the development of Steam Odyssey exhibition. Um, looking into potential of AR to change the architectural industry, as well as kind of our shared interest in computational design and digital fabrication. Uh, I will begin this presentation with a short clip by Australian futurist and author Brett King.
Over the last 250 years, we've seen a lot of major disruptions as a result of technology. For the machine age, it was the steam engine and later the combustion engine, bringing on the end of the industrial age. For the atomic and space age, it was nuclear energy and taking men to the moon in these uh, massive rockets. The digital age was all about computers, electronics, and in the later stages, the internet. Is this encyclopedia or National Geographic? But the next stage, the augmented age, is going to be about you and I and the way we live our life. And over the next 15 to 20 years, Almost every aspect of the way we live our daily life is set to change. So we are entering the augmented age. Um, and it is predicted that augmented reality devices will become mainstream media for enhancing the capabilities of future workers. Uh, recent trends have seen kind of constant drop in prices and increase in accessibility of head-mounted uh, mixed reality devices, which are slowly finding their way into multiple industries as aid in manufacturing or visualization of data. This allows us to go beyond the constraints of 2D displays and fully immerse ourselves into kind of full-scale interactive models throughout the design process. Also, um, augmented reality is finding its way into our daily lives. It is changing the way we perceive our physical environment through different digital overlays, or through the ways in uh, which, which we interact with the environment. But so what? What can this mean for architects and the way in which we design and build? Over the past decade, we are witnessing a rapid advancement on both practical and theoretical levels in regards to automated construction, and as a consequence of increasing sophistication of digital fabrication technologies such as robotic fabrication and assembly, large-scale robotic 3D printing, and so on. So this emerging trajectory uh, within digital design research, which is focused on automation and robotics, attempts to give architects an unprecedented level of precision and control over materialization of their designs. However, um, the, the distinctive nuances and subtleties of traditional craft practices are absent from uh, the artifacts of robotic production, as since the intuition and understanding of these qualitative aspects of a project are kind of difficult to describe in, in deterministic and explicit language of machines. So as part of our so means in my previous research at the uh, Bartlett School of Architecture in London, uh, we try to challenge this discrepancy um, as, as part of the teaching staff of Research Cluster 6, together with Daniel Widrig and Stefan Bassing, and later uh, Guan Li and Adam Holloway. So in RC5 and 6, we would start by asking questions about the material through design, digitally and manually, with a kind of a hands-on approach, which was set firmly in the realms of empirical testing of matter and fabrication architectural scale. Our design research methodology at the time prioritized uh, sort of a hybrid fabrication techniques, favoring customized systems and semi-automated processes. And the nature of our experimentation was grounded in cyclical processes of making prototypes with rigorous and iterative refinement of products um, and, and kind of built elements. Um, we encouraged making without preconceptions, allowing for the characteristics of material and fabrication techniques uh, to inform and enrich the outcome. And in parallel to, to the material research, computational models for simulation of material behavior were developed in order to expand the design repertoire. But although we would kind of consider this methodology successful in its approach to materiality and, and uh, modes of production, there would always sort of remain a gap between what can be simulated and what can be physically produced in a timely manner, which was kind of due to the sheer complexity of some of these processes and um, limitation in the amount of data a human can process. So could the augmented reality technologies actually play a role in this equation and, and kind of bridge the gap between material-based processes and automation. 
So rather than this being a question of man versus machine, where kind of machines are seen superior in terms of precision, can it be one of a man and machine in collaborative process or man as machine, where through augmented reality devices, now the humans have access to data and information, which was previously exclusive only to the machines. So what we see on the screen is a test of holographic bricklaying by hologram and students at RMIT, which indeed asks kind of the question, do we really need expensive robots for you know, complex bricklaying if a human, doesn't matter if, if they're experienced or not, can now see the exact same precise instruction for creation of these complex geometries. So since 2017, BPRO Research Cluster 9, which was started and, then, and previously led by Sumin Ham and currently is taught by Alvaro Lopez, Jose Pareja and myself, uh, has been developing the research into application of augmented realities in architecture um, in processes of design and fabrication, as well as kind of direct feedback and collaboration between man and machine through, through the use of AR technologies. Um, so RC9 focuses on sort of a hybrid approach to making, which is neither purely analog nor purely automated, proposing alternative strategies for fabrication of, of uh, digitally designed architectural structures uh, by utilizing cutting edge head mounted devices to holographically assist workers in the manufacturing and assembly of, um, of these highly varied components through traditional craft techniques. Um, this building within mixed reality environments kind of eliminates the redundancies uh, um, of, of traditional processes, which rely heavily on kind of like a lot of drawings and so on by displaying these design models at scale and making them ready to handle in the context of any given fabrication environment. Um, so these holographic models basically democratize the understanding of design intent and enable all the collaborators to more effectively contribute their expertise to the design project, regardless of their digital literacy. Um, in that sense, making in the mixed realities kind of invigorates traditional craftsmanship by augmenting a hand and material skills with the precision and formal possibilities of digital modeling. Um, so I'm just gonna play this again, um, because uh, what you see here on the screen are um, short clips from um, RC9 projects from period over two years, uh, of over two years in which Sumin was uh, teaching at the cluster at the moment. And um, uh, while focusing on the AR assisted fabrications, these projects also looked into kind of different modes of feedback through machine vision, uh, for example, allowing for designs to be adjusted on the fly, uh, where not only human builders would follow the, the holographic instructions, but would also make changes and then the computer models would react and readjust to uh, new conditions. Um, and what you see here is a project from last year, uh, which I was teaching together with um, Alvaro. Um, and the project looks at kind of alternative modes of production of complex ceramic pieces using rope as substrate for clay. Um, and what it does is it also further explores this idea of a user following holographic instructions um, on, for weaving of the patterns, which you can see in the video at the top right but also proposes a method where designer would draw the pattern in AR and store it in database and kind of become part of the, the new design language in such way. So what this essentially allows is for kind of decentralization and democratization of design process where anyone can participate regardless of their skill level. And kind of, especially in, in, in the time of pandemic, it kind of opens the door for, um, and, and gives tools for kind of architectural production being seen as sort of a um, kind of gig economy. Um, and then, but also beyond kind of just uh, AR assisted fabrication, um, what, what we've been looking at the Bartlett at the moment, but also Sumin uh, with her students uh, in instinctual machine seminar, 
uh, done at SciArc is kind of going beyond just uh, using AR as a holographic guide, but um, seeing how the mixed realities can actually change the way that we interact with the city and also perceive our uh, built environment. So, um, and then kind of as, as sort of an introduction to, uh, to the piece uh, which is exhibited um, and, and where actually this research also comes from is, is the Steampunk Pavilion, um, which was built in 2019 for Tallinn Architecture Biennale. Uh, and the project was um, done by uh, Sumin Kham, um, William Yan and Cameron Newham from uh, Fologram and myself. Um, so the competition has kind of historically been interested in engaging with the, the local timber industry in Estonia. And that was sort of a, the, the only um, uh, requirement. And our proposal Steampunk combines the traditional craft of steam bending timber with high-tech holographic design and construction. Um, so the steam bending itself is kind of an existing crafting method. And traditionally, steam bending requires expensive one or two part molds to produce precise parts. Or molds for non-planar parts become extremely complex and kind of not very sustainable uh, in the chain of production. Um, so to overcome this problem of kind of complex molds, we, we prototype an adaptable formwork uh, for double curved timber strips using holographic guide generated in real time from digital models. Um, and since kind of winning the competition initially, we, we started building series of prototypes, uh, which, would be, which were built in a in, uh, couple of workshops, uh, one done at Temple University and another one in Aarhus. Um, so what I will play now is basically how this whole process works. Uh, of steam bending, where each board is placed in a plastic bag, which would essentially act as a steaming chamber. And uh, what this had as a result is that it allowed us to um, still steam the parts uh, while, while we were forming them and placing on the formwork. And that would kind of increase our time uh, of bending to up to five minutes uh, rather than having just kind of 45 seconds after taking them out of the steaming chamber. Um, so, and, and in that way, we kind of eliminated the need to, um, 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 yeah, and then kind of uh, fabricating the formwork, um, we, we eliminated the need to design and fabricate those molds. And instead the formwork uh, would be assembled on the fly, kind of just using these cheap scrap timbers, uh, which were placed following the, the <coughs> holographic information. Um, so this essentially had kind of an effect of distributing the skills because anyone could participate in the fabrication process regardless of you know, previous experience. So none of us ever uh, steam bent anything basically before, uh, before we started building this, um, but kind of uh, just through, through the use of this um, technology, we were able to engage in the, the whole process. Um, so in addition to how we bend the timber, also the steel brackets were um, bent using holographic guides. They were designed to be fabricated from uh, flat stainless steel bars, um, which eliminated any need for kind of laser cutting or prefabrication. Um, all the brackets were unique, consisting of up to 30 planar bands. Um, and, and then together with the timber, they basically form a composite shell. So uh, the holographic interface was also developed for kind of bending sequence. Um, and then, oops, did I skip a slide? Yeah, so essentially the, the holographic models enabled us to kind of completely eliminate 2D drawings from design and construction process. Um, by kind of precisely positioning these holographic models directly within the construction site, we were able to visualize the installation um, 
and kind of visualize the installation sequence of strips and brackets, as well as kind of complete the chunks of the pavilion. So the, avail the ability for anyone to view a holographic model of the finished state at construction site at any time allowed us for allowed kind of for these flimsy and flexible parts to be actually reliably installed without the need for you know expensive templates, 3D scans, and and so on. Um, so we also expected that the structure would slump under the self weight. So we had to build, make several reinforcement brackets after you know, most of the structure was built. Um, so we digitized the timber strips, which were made using paper markers and um, tracked with HoloLens. And then these digitized geometries were streamed to a parametric model, which would uh, we would generate uh, we would generate and use to build um, the new brackets on site. Um, so essentially this kind of idea of augmenting analog tools with precision of holographic guides enabled for this very low cost, fast and flexible, uh, but also approximate fabrication of parts allowing for this kind of high tolerance system. Um, you know, suddenly anyone could participate in any fabrication process, including quality control, um, and and um, as the result, we found that we could increase the complexity of parts without increasing the risk of fabrication mistakes, uh, which you know in turn kind of made delivering this ambitious design possible. Um, so what we essentially hoped with this project was kind of to, to create a provocation in the age of ubiquitous digital design and production. Um, it is. It kind of took a fundamentally polemic position towards automation, uh, precision, and repeatability in favor of intuition, nuance, and craft. Um, so basically, you know, the, the piece that is exhibited in as part of the Steam Odyssey exhibition is an evolution of Steampunk Pavilion, right? Where we uh, intended to move beyond the pavilion and actually kind of propose a portion or a prototype of an inhabitable structure. Um, and kind of bring the, the uh, augmented reality assisted fabrication one step closer to kind of wider application in the architectural industry. Um, so that's basically that for, for this short presentation. I hope you enjoyed. And um, now uh, we will see another uh, video uh, explaining a bit more about um, the exhibition piece itself, as well as kind of uh, the exhibition AR experience. So thank you very much. The centerpiece of the exhibition has been built over the course of three months by SIR students and faculty. It is a design prototype of a fully functioning inhabitable space. The design is based on a fluid geometry where the curves travel around the three-dimensional spaces, continuously giving the audiences a unique visual experience. The traveling lines harmoniously combine all architectural elements into one whole so there is no distinction between column, roof, or slabs. Curves loops back to provide structural stability as well as potential windows and door frames. The main structure is constituted of two parts, the steam bent timber and the fold bent metal brackets. The double layered condition allows the structure to accommodate potential infills to create proper enclosures such as insulation, envelope, and so on. The construction process was designed to bend 
multiple straps in one set of formwork for production efficiency. The formworks are set it up in a precise position by the help of augmented reality headsets. All metal bracket joints are also manually bent based on AR technology. The entire structure is initially built into four unique chunks and then the fifth chunk is bent and assembled on top of the previously fabricated four chunks. Every single cons constituted element is closely and tightly interrelated to each other to create a harmonious whole. The video is a documentary of our steam bending journey. Showcase some of the making process, zoomed in details, assembly process and so on. The structure is built and then separated into three parts, moved into the gallery and reassembled. The exhibition itself can be also experienced through an augmented reality app where you can see one-to-one -one scaled mock-up details of our fully enclosed wall segment, bracket bending experience, and the steam bending workshop setup. The structure manifests a much wider potential of our future built environment and the ways to look at technologies. Technology can look like this. It's hidden behind somewhere, but we can experience and see its clear and permanent footprint. This exhibition is open until 29th August. I hope you can visit and experience the structure in real life and feel the impact of the space, materiality and details. Finally, I would like to thank all our team members, helpers and supporters. Thank you. For those of you who cannot visit, we recorded a video walkthrough of the gallery. Hope you enjoy the experience.
We have also developed an AR app so you can explore the spaces with more immersive experience. So when you walk into the gallery, you can install our app on your phone or pick up our device and launch our app and then scan the QR code on the floor. Then you will see a menu coming up and starting from here you can click and see and experience three different points of attraction. The first one is a portion of our detailed mock-up where you can see all different enclosure types and underlining structures. You can turn on and off layers such as window, envelope, joints all in one-to-one -one scale. And after that, you can walk over to the corner and experience the hologram that we used during our making process in our workshop space. The first thing on the left corner you will see is our bending table. You can play the video to see how the bracket bending instructions work. And on the right, you will see the formwork that we use to bend our steamed timber boards. You can click the buttons to show and hide different elements.
Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, yeah, as a last session of this event, we are going to have a, a conversation or a feedback session from our science faculty and director. Yeah. And today we have Hernan Diaz Alonso, our director, uh, joining us. Thank you very much. We have Casey Ram, uh, and later we might have also John Enright joining us. Uh, and we also have uh, Igor Pantic. Oh, John is coming here. Uh, John, thank you for coming. Uh, yeah, so we have also Igor Pantic uh, joining from London. Yeah. And maybe uh, firstly, I know uh, Hannah, you need to leave uh, earlier. So um, uh, yeah, maybe uh, this is a, a, a time uh, that I um, we are trying to maybe uh, get a bit of uh, impression and feedback and uh, thoughts from uh, from you, yeah. So maybe Hernan, uh, uh, yeah, can you maybe tell us about maybe your thoughts about this uh, gallery piece? <laughs> uh, sure. Well, first to me, Igor, congratulations. Uh, it's, it's, it's a great piece, uh, and I've seen it over the last two or three months, being under construction in our parking lot. So it has been super interesting to see the evolution of the process. Um, I think it's a, uh, it's, it's a kind of project, it's a kind of piece that gets my attention because it, de it deals with uh, the notion of the performance of form, but also in, in both of your cases have to do with innovation and technology. Maybe, maybe more than, more, more than, 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 than comment, uh, uh, as I said, I, I, I like the piece quite a lot. I think it's super interesting. Uh, and I think the, the in the gallery, historically, I think there have been three kind of installations. I think the, the self-standing piece, like, which I think this one belongs to, which they think is by there, by himself, and it became uh, the thing. The one that they are more like uh, trying to play with the space of the gallery. Uh, and, and there's a third one, which I think are more atmospheric. I think yours is have to do with, um, in a way, the power of the form. And the power of, 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 of the material in relation to it. But, but a question I have for both of you, which is something that I was curious, is um, the intersection uh, and the appetite to, to use something like wood, which is a very traditional material, mixed with this super kind of a very contemporary cutting edge technology. Uh, and this is something that fascinates me. What's going on with that mix? And I think everybody has a different point of view. Uh, and I think that is that is uh, there is a body of research happening in many parts of the world that try to do that. But I want I want to hear the take of both of you in relation to this, which I think is at the center of, of what you're doing. Yeah, maybe uh, I can first answer, and then maybe yeah. Igor can answer. Yeah. So uh, for me, what's really interesting, uh, what I was really interested in is. Firstly, uh, I see a lot of limitations uh, on the digital fabrication research. Yeah, they have been uh, over the last decades. They have been developed uh, quite um, quite heavily on 3D printing and CNC machining, and most of the cases, the materiality has 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 to become very much simplified or the making processes has to be a very simplified down to a very simple assemblies and, and so on. And a lot of complex materials or processes uh, are has, has to be neglected from the, the, the digital uh, fabrication research. So um, many of uh, my previous studies also in Bartlett has uh, to do with like testing different materiality and trying to search for different uh, um, material systems together. So I thought this, uh, the, the launch of augmented reality has, uh, the headsets have been a great opportunity for me to really uh, test this out. So uh, that's how I personally started this research to bridge these two. Um, and I really see a mo lot more potential in the future to, uh, in, in terms of um, a, an ordinary human enhanced by, <clears throat> enhanced by uh, wearable uh, technologies. Uh, so the AR headset is just the beginning and there can be a lot more potentials uh, coming up 
with the technology, then uh, we as architects, I think we should uh, also uh, learn and talk about different uh, or, or challenge about different material behavior. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I, I, I was maybe talking too much. Yeah, what people, how about you? I mean, obviously, I, I completely agree with what you just said. Uh, I would just like to add, like, you know, also why timber or why this specific, like, why steam bending, right? Um, like, we also believe that, you know, the uh, augmented reality technologies have, um, besides this kind of um, power to, to um, empower people, you know, you can also source local materials and, and uh, materials which are usually not seen as something that, for example, can can create something complex, or uh, or in order to create complex forms, uh, they would have to be put through through very expensive processes. Um, so our kind of um, interest was to see like how complex, for example, you can go with timber, uh, an everyday material that could be sourced anywhere in the world, more or less, um, but still kind of have, you know, something that is. Uh, there is a good architecture. Yeah, thank you for the question, Anna. Yeah, I don't know if that was a good answer. Um, maybe. No, yeah, I, uh, no, I think it was a good answer. Maybe it's a good sad way to, to, to mm. bring Casey in, which is another, yeah. another of, of the riders of technology in relation to good. Um, you, 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 he may have a, another take on this, but anyway. I, I just want to congratulate both of you and, 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 and let Casey and John uh, to follow up. Uh, maybe I'll jump in then. Um, thank you, Sumin and Igor. Um, I've had the privilege of uh, seeing the be made as I've uh, been going into through the parking lot uh, the last uh, few months and watching you labor. Uh, and, and in fact, I have to send you some photos because I saw you actually inserting it into the side of the building uh, and into the gallery, which is no mean feat. Uh, the fact that that piece entered what I presume is like a six foot by eight foot uh, aperture on the side of the building uh, and in, which is was really awesome. So I'm going to send you some uh, photos and videos of that that I that I took. Uh, you know. Uh, two things, I, 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 I kind of two part question. Um, uh, and, and again, thank you. Uh, uh, one has to do with the, the tools we use. Um, you know, we, we, we have a, a, an old, you know, if the tool you have is a hammer, you'll start treating all problems like a nail. Um, so, uh, the, the, the idea of AR related to at least two projects you've done, which have to do with the bending of wood. And there's a history of that having to do with ship furniture design and other things that we know. Uh, so to, to me, the, the tool is unrelated to that as a formal uh, project. So my first question is, how linked are you to the, let's say, striated linear formal project behind Igor and behind Sumin and your business, number one. Uh, 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 and then number two, as a corollary to that, for instance, if I was to say your material was clay and you were a model that then you used AR to make something uh, related to that, there would be, it would, I presume it would be completely different uh, uh, in, in terms of the way it was made, but maybe not. Uh, so I guess that's 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 really my question, um, and uh, it, may, it may be uh, open ended, and you may be, in fact, uh, 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 say that that it, it's not a formal problem. But but I'm but I'm interested in that, like the links between the formal aspect of the work, the tools which one uses to implement or uh, either uh, 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 envision and then build the work uh, versus what the aspirations of actually the conceptual basis of the work is. So a long-winded question, but I may answer that. Igor, maybe do you want to go first? 
my turn. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, well, I mean, you know, in, in, the, in this case, or steampunk pavilion case, obviously, the form was to a certain extent driven by purely by material behavior and what timber can do and, and how can we form it through the process of steam bending. Um, but also kind of um, thinking how to maximize also the spatial potential um, that of the design that we create through um, through such material formation process. Um, you know, are we in love with the, the timber strips? Not necessarily, right? Um, kind of the, the idea is that what we are also trying to, to show um, in this exhibition is that this is not necessarily kind of uh, how the project would end up only in timber strips, but that it's basically part of a, let's say, um, a construction system which could be later on cladded with something and, you know, um, with added finished materials uh, where basically the, the timber strips would just become kind of a vehicle to achieve the, the, the complex form, let's say. So, you know, would it be, can it be any, some other material? Probably yes, right? Uh, would it look same if it was out of clay? Probably no, <laughs> you know. Um, I guess it all depends on the kind of the process that, that we would take in in the um, in the material formation. Yeah, we're I think dealing, we're dealing with the material. Yeah, I think uh, in the same uh, trend of the the answer, I think. Um, yeah, definitely. I agree that the form is um, very much driven by how uh, we understand the material behavior. Yeah, and uh, we we are kind of trying to follow what material wants to do, and uh, the curvature and the decision of the curvature and the way they are assembled together. It's all based on that kind of material constraints. Uh, that is taken in consideration. So those material uh, behaviors, um, material properties are coming always in the front. Uh, and then uh, we kind of explore what's more challenging, what's more beautiful and complex, and uh, what, what kind of things we can uh, produce as an interesting spatial experience. And that's coming uh, next. So we are kind of trying and trying to challenge the material to do something more interesting and beautiful. Um, yeah, and in terms of tools, we think everything is tool, even like our hands are tools, our eyes are tools. And, um, and I think it's really important uh, that how we know how to manipulate tools and hack into tools and change them to be able to do something uh, else. So uh, instead of uh, accepting a given tool, um, like how we hack into it, it's, it's a one really important uh, aspect of the entire research journey, I think. Yeah. And I think more importantly, in this specific piece, uh, we uh, hacked into the process of steam, traditional steam bending, uh, because normally, traditionally, steam bending requires a one-off heavy and expensive mold, and they can only achieve few curvatures. But because of the introduced AR, we could uh, manipulate the molding system, so we could create a lot of different curvatures, so we freed out. So I think that is really important, and uh, all the other former explorations come in allowed. Uh, from that like starting point of being able to hack into the tool and the making point. I think if I can just add, sorry to take too much time. I, I really like your comment, John, about you know, if, if your tool is a hammer, every problem you, you see is a nail. Uh, I, I think the idea of using AR is that you want to see if there are other answers then to that question, right? Can we then look at things the other way, even if we only have a, a, a hammer, right? Yeah, yeah, that's a very uh, interesting question. And yeah, so maybe what's more important is what we want to achieve instead of looking at what we uh, grasped as a tool. Yeah, so that's why we can 
uh, we have our like, ambitious goal and what, if we got a hammer, we can actually change the hammer into something else because maybe uh, our problem is uh, not solvable with nails. I hope, yeah. Thank you for the comments and conversation. Yeah, I hope that was, a, <laughs> that, was an, that answered the question. Yeah, Hernan, thank you very much. You have to leave. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Yeah. Hernan. And maybe Casey, do you maybe wanna say, or do you have visited us uh, many times during our making process? Yeah, very kindly and really appreciate your support and um, yeah. Physically support. Attention. Right? <laughs> yeah. Holding the thing up for a while. Um, <laughs> No, I mean, congratulations, guys. Like, it's, it's a really impressive um, installation. Watching the workflow this year has been really fascinating. Um, and not, not just in terms of this installation, but this, this has become a kind of new normal for you, uh, I mean, at least uh, from what I've seen on Sue means, and um, both in terms of your practice in your office, but also in the coursework that you do here at SIARC. Um, I think a lot, of, a lot of us that do uh, kind of applied studies seminars and things in the robot house, had to really scale back things in terms of production uh, because of COVID. This and your seminar didn't didn't skip a beat. Like you were able to use this technology to kind of deploy the design ideas and work through and communicate construction. So the students were fabricating amazing things in their apartments. And I know that you're also like I think you're going to take a maybe 12 hour break and then you're jumping on to um, you know finishing the production on an installation going up to the Sol Biennale this September. Um, how do you see this as becoming the, the new model of practice and, and how has this kind of way of sharing information globally like changed the way you think about both um, how you communicate with uh, production teams, how you communicate with each other uh, remotely as so how you work with students as an educator? Thank you, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, it has been uh, really, uh, uh, let's say, lucky <laughs> to have, I happened to use AR and there was pandemic and it was a really, <laughs> really good uh, way of communicating remotely and uh, delivering information uh, more intuitively, uh, virtually. Uh, but I think uh, this is a trend anyways, even if there was no pandemic, uh, the trend is a uh, uh, or, or the technological development is going for a uh, more efficient lifestyle. And um, yeah, it's an inevitable thing to, for humanity to really explore uh, more efficient ways of communicating. So I think AR uh, has been, uh, or, or any kind of uh, wearable devices, I think there is a very, uh, uh, bright market uh, or a future uh, develop uh, future um, uh, potentials. Yeah, so I think uh, I, I see that it's going to impact not only practices but also like every aspect of our uh, daily lives. Uh, so definitely, it is very crucial for uh, practices to uh, think about and adopt uh, this kind of new technology in various and creative ways. Um, yeah, so Igor, do you maybe wanna add something? I mean, well, you, you said most of it, and I, but I'm just thinking about the, um, the augmented ground project that, that you did in Canada, right? And um, I think that's also kind of a, a proof that essentially no one from the project team was there on site. Right, but you had the kind of um, direct link with the digital twin, seeing always what's being built um, uh, while you were in LA. Hanjun was here in London, and so on. Right, so yeah. I think that's kind of an obvious. Obviously, it's not kind of directly AR technology, but it, it's from the same family, right? And kind of everything goes in the same basket. And you know, your students were fabricating also last year in the instinctual machine seminar. We also had a couple of teams like team in China, one guy in, in Ecuador building a prototype with his 
family who never you know built anything but they just brought a hololens and kind of built a prototype so i think that's really kind of um, um, an amazing potential that, that this has for the industry but you know also beyond like what we are obviously interested in you know design and fabrication i think it also has the potential to uh, you know, change the, the way that you supervise the site, quality control, and all these things, right? That, you know, we kind of take for granted, but actually uh, the mixed reality technology can make it much, much more efficient. I, I think that's a super interesting point. I mean, I think there's a dichotomy between uh, the use of as a, an efficiency machine which in, in the construction industry, which of course we know will come and will come through the market, a kind of a better mousetrap, if you will. Uh, what I find interesting about work is it, it can accept that as a, uh, but that's not really what it's about. It's about seeing then the complexity that can be pushed that kind of technology vis-a-vis uh, -vis the built environment. Uh, and, and then I think there's another, which has to do with collaboration, which, which is very interesting. Also having to do with what we do, all four of us as teachers, um, in the ability to collaborate three-dimensionally in really immersive ways, even virtual and physical ways which to me is really, really interesting. The ability to, let's say, manipulate a physical model overlaid with a kind of digital model interactively and feedback across both uh, in-person and of course, uh, because we're in COVID, uh, remote learning, uh, which, which either because of happens or, or also because that, that that's a better way to communicate with more, more people in the world uh, is very, very interesting, untapped, I believe, in terms of its potential. And that involves, you know, ways of thinking and ways of designing. It's not purely production. So it's very interesting to me, these tools, they, they touch upon on a lot of things that have to do with, uh, you know, if you were a venture capitalist, you might be interested in the production aspects of this because it would be uh, interesting vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, faster ways to lay brick and uh, cut two by fours and things like that. And, and, and absolutely, we can predict that in our lifetimes that that will be the case. Uh, yet, we as architects and designers and, and you guys, I think, are touching on, well, what possible physical futures does that change? And this is why maybe it loops back to my uh, question about the hammer and the nail uh <laughs> where are, are the so are we defining the tools i i think you're trying to um design the tools or at least tools in ways that that enable uh interesting futures or potential futures and uh, i think i can't think of anything uh more sciarc than that so Kudos to you. You've, you've really spurned me on. I, I, I really uh, 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 want to want to get involved in this and support it in the school as many ways we can. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, it's. I think it's time for us to wrap up this conversation. Yeah. But thank you so much for give. Uh, spending your time on joining us. Yeah, I really appreciate your feedback. Yeah, I learned a lot. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you so much.
Thank you very much. And thank you, Hernan, John, Casey, and Igor for the fantastic conversation to wrap up this event. Uh, very valuable, insightful comments. Uh, I really appreciate. And finally, I would like to thank our team members for their tremendous hard work. Uh, Igor, Hanjun, David, Shun, thank you for your great and long time effort. And I also want to thank Murphy Lee for fantastic AR app development and Iguan for amazing video. And I also want to thank a Format Engineer and Conejo Hardwood for their consultancy and sponsorship. Uh, and thank all SciArc faculty and staff and students for their tremendous support. And finally, thanks to Hernan and John for, their oppor for the opportunity to make this happen. Okay, so finally, I want to thank all the audiences in front of the screen for your kind attention and hope you enjoyed the event tonight. And we are honored to be uh, able to spend time with you to show our project and share our thoughts. And hope you have a chance to visit our gallery in the coming weeks. And this will be the end of this event. And thank you very much. Please come join us. <laughs>